sessions because it was an eight session intervention, right? So as you can see, this was still pretty challenging. This is what we would consider decent. This is not bad, but we need improvements, as you'll see. So 23 out of the 27, so 85% assigned to support intervention showed up at least for one session, so they were engaged. But only 44% completed five or more sessions. Right? Um, and the control group, 75% engaged in treatment. And similarly, about 43, 12 out of the 28 women completed five or more sessions. So you can see literally half the women are not showing up for more than five sessions, right? So that's problematic. We have developed a treatment. We did a lot of work to develop it, and yet literally half the population that we randomized in these interventions were showing up. At least it was good that it was not differential um, attendance. The attendance was pretty similar across intervention and control group. An average of four sessions is what women attended overall across the sample. Okay? In terms of retention, um, so retention is you know, how much were we able to retain women for assessments, subsequent assessments. So 78% of the women, so 43 out of 55 of the women completed one or both the assessments. And this is really important because if you don't have this data, there is no way you can evaluate your intervention. So I can tell you this is very hard work. When I finished my K, I swore I would never do an intervention trial again. <laughs> and yet I'm back at it because as a clinician, I'm like, that's all I can seem to ask is, what do we do about this? Uh, but it's really tough. It's exciting to, you know, I did this trial uh, from 2009 to 2014. And about two months ago, I got an email. This woman found me from nowhere, randomly met someone who had been my pro program coordinator on my study and said, where is Dr. Mithil? I need to email her. So even now, you know, it's so amazing. She says her email, I've kept it. I got it two months ago saying we changed her life. She has become an advocate for DV victims, has done so much work. It's unbelievable what she's doing now. So that's what keeps me going when I feel like, oh my god, this is a nightmare and I can't cope. I think of even one person that we radically changed is fantastic. Um, so overall, I can skip some of this if we want to have more of a discussion, but I want to some of my main outcomes were really sexual health related. So condom use is really important, right? Are women using more condoms in their relationships? Again, think of it as risk reduction. Absolute would be fantastic. You're in the field of substance abuse, so you understand harm reduction, right? That's the main term that we use in substance abuse. The goal for my intervention was also harm reduction. Could I make them 100% safe? I would love that. Is that realistic? Probably not. So we wanted to see if we can improve condom use, improve conversations about sexual health, because that's harm reduction. And then did we reduce frequency and intensity of violence um, among the women as compared to the control group. So I'll share a couple of these uh, very quickly. So support participants, um, let me see. Oh, what did I do? Okay, ah, there. Uh, so this is the line, the rounds are for support participants and the squares are for control group. Right, so as you can see from this graph, from baseline to first assessment, so after the intervention really, there was a 45% reduction in total episodes of unprotected sex for support participants. We didn't see, obviously in the control group, as you can see, it kept increasing. Um, support participants also reported much higher levels of uh, safe uh, conversations about safer sex compared to the control group. So we saw some changes just within support participants, but some changes across, and which is what you would like to see, right? Were they better than the control group? Uh, so here we saw these were statistically significantly different between um, control group and support group, both at um, post-assessment and three-month follow-ups. So they were having many more conversations about safer sex. Um, in terms of violence, um, both support and control groups, as you can see, significantly reduce their experiences of violence because our support group was very heavy DV focused. Right? Um, in terms of our, uh, we, I used uh, an assessment called abusive behavior inventory, which really tracks different experiences that women have. And as we can see, uh, support participants had greater reductions compared to the control group. 
uh, we also asked about the last, because sometimes it's very hard globally to talk about violence. So getting event level data is very helpful. Event level means think of the last time it happened, right? That's much more easy. I mean, sometimes we can't remember what we had for breakfast. So if we narrow it down, because it's all self-report, it's much easier to ask people, think of the last time this happened to you, what did you do? Right, so we asked them about the last time they had sex and did they experience violence. So there were some reductions of experiences of violence among support group participants the last time they had sex. Uh, also relationship power, as I had talked about, is a really important concept. Uh, so as you can see, support group participants had higher relationship power compared to the control group at post-assessment and three-month follow-up. So overall, what does this mean? Just bring five years of work together. Uh, what we saw is women with recent and current, so they had to ha report experiences in the last three months, right? So we were not looking at before that, even though a lot of them had. Uh, so this was very unique and different, is we had women, several of them were currently in abusive relationships, right? Oftentimes we say, go leave the abuser and then we'll help you have better health. But a lot of the women don't leave their partnerships. So this was really important. And what we learned was that we can successfully recruit them. Retention was not as successful, I think, could be improved. Uh, support intervention significantly reduced reports of unprotected sex, increased communication about safer sex between partners. Also, it had significant experiences on women's experiences of violence, right? Uh, but what we had to think of, things that didn't work well, is next steps. How do we improve uh, uh, um, attendance, right? Approximately average number of sessions attended were four out of eight, even though we had done so much work and we had such dedicated staff, it was unbelievable uh, because the research was funding it. That's part of the reason why some of these evidence-based programs don't do so well when they get integrated back into community settings is because, as you'll hear Jessica say, where is the time and the energy and the money coming from, right, to be able to support it? I had dedicated research staff that were calling women, following our personal relationships, and yet we had such a difficult time. Um, also, we had to figure out, you know, we saw some changes between baseline and post-assessment. Some things sustained for three months, some tanked, right? So those things didn't sustain. So we were talking about, I'm sorry if I'm blocking. Um, so we had to figure out, you know, how do we, what do we do? Do we have booster sessions? What kinds of things do we do? So that's how the change can be sustained. And lastly, a lot of the women said, you know, these are relational issues. You need to talk to my partner. And so what do we do? And as family therapists, you know, that's one thing that we know that there are different types of violence. Not all violence is the same, and there are ways that we can engage partners, right? And so that was things that, and then I moved um, to University of Maryland. So that was four years ago. So a lot of my work was all done in upstate New York. So to figure out, you know, it took me a couple of years to figure out, so what now? Now that I have all this data, I've done this intervention, so now what I'm doing is, I have an R01 under submission. Now, for those of you who don't know, R01 is like the golden goose of funded research from NIH. Uh, so I have something under submission. I should know probably in a couple of months if I'm going to get it or not. But this is really taking the work that I did in my key award and doing a really large landomized clinical trial. So we uh, have said we'll uh, recruit uh, 360 women. And we have also narrowed down further, so changes that I made for this application, right? So it's lessons learned from the K and changes for the R01. Um, so now I'm working specifically with two community-based agencies that are HIV prevention and care organizations in the community that work a lot with women. Um, so these are, they work with women at high risk for HIV, right? So that's the given. And now we're gonna screen them primarily for IPV. Right? So that's one thing. Instead of going all out into the community, we are zeroing down on high-risk groups by working with community-based organizations already. Um, we've reduced the number of sessions from eight to six. Now that took a lot of thinking in terms of figuring out what needs to go, but obviously eight was not sustainable is what we really heard. So the goal is to make it shorter, more condensed, but this is also a highly traumatized population. The in the door and out the door is very difficult to do, but that's what we're doing. 
And uh, we decided to really focus on African-American women, given the statistics that I shared earlier. One in 32 women in the country, African-American, will contract HIV. And the area where I live in, Maryland and DC, it's, the statistics are like sub-Saharan Africa. So it's really, really critical to want to do something about black populations within the region that I'm in. Um, so this is really important when you're writing grants. You have to talk about how your work fits within the funding priorities of the organization and why they have to fund you, right? That they would be really remiss if they're not funding your work. So what we are doing is addressing NIH and Office of AIDS research high priority, which is to reduce health disparities in the incidence of new HIV infections, right? There's tremendous health disparities. The next that I did was I got another grant after saying that I wouldn't do intervention work. I have a new grant from NIH, and this is couples-based. Uh, so again, lessons learned from my care ward, right? Women saying we need to do something in relationships. I'm really excited about this work, but I have to say it's, again, one of those things that's been very tough. And I was talking a little bit about we're having a tough time recruiting couples. Uh, so I'll talk just very briefly about this. So what is this intervention focused on? It's focused on adapting and pre-testing uh, the feasibility and acceptability of a couples-based, I'll explain what Sava syndemic informed risk reduction intervention for HIV negative African American couples, heterosexual couples, who report high risk sexual behavior, intimate partner violence, and drug use. Couldn't be more complicated, right? They have to meet all of these criteria. So Sava syndemic is a term in the field of HIV, kind of what you would think of as comorbidities. Right, so it's a public health word. Um, and as you can see, I just wanted to put some of this down, which I took directly from my application, to give you language, just to show you language that you have to use when you're writing these applications. It's, it's not very intuitive. This is learned language, um, and you have to keep relearning the language. Um, but Saba syndemic is basically substance abuse, S, substance abuse, S-A. V is for violence, A is for AIDS. Right, so they're bringing this together and they call it Sava syndemic. That what's putting people at risk is not these independent epidemics, these are epidemics that are combined and come together, and that's why they enhance vulnerability of people. So now we're recruiting HIV negative African American heterosexual couples who report that they're having sex with other people or doing things that are placing them at high risk for HIV, that they are engaging at least in some form of substance abuse. Now we've kept it open as to what that could be. And they report relationship conflict. Okay, this is not easy, and we're bringing them together as couples. And it's been very, very difficult because a lot of them don't want to talk in front of their partners. So they can do individually focused work, but they do not want to be with each other when we are doing this work. So that's where we are at right now. Um, so this work has two specific aims. One was, you know, I wanted to adapt something existing, so the theoretical frameworks that I'm using. So I work with Dr. Norman Epstein. I don't know how many of you know his work. He has a couples-based IPV intervention, which is CBT-informed, um, has had some evidence of success. So I wanted to take that and adapt it for HIV, right? So that's what we're doing. So the first year, which I'm currently in right now, uh, we wanted to do a lot of interviews again, the similar way that I worked uh, in my K award to adapt the intervention, interview couples, talk to them about this is the work that we're thinking of doing, how do you relate to this, and just getting their feedback. In the summer of this year, we're supposed to adapt the intervention that we have, and then subsequently next year, because this is a two-year grant, so it's a lot, very much condensed, uh, we're doing a randomized clinical trial. Um, so again, like I said, CBCT, I just finished telling you this. So where are we recruiting from currently in Maryland and DC? Uh, we are at substance abuse treatment programs, uh, you know, pitching people, like pretend you're all in a group, so I have you know, trained doctoral students who go out, talk to groups about this is what we're doing. Uh, would you be interested in doing focus groups or individual interviews or surveys with us? And we're paying couples $50 to meet with us one time at this point so that we can interview them, understand how they think of this and what we can do to help. 
and then we'll adapt all of this for the randomized clinical trial. Uh, we're also at HIV prevention and care organizations. And the last one we just started, which I'm really excited to share with you, is we are in barbershops. It is so interesting. I don't know if you know Loretta Sweet. So she's the only person I know who's a drag cell now who has been in barbershops doing HIV work, but she has primarily uh, had one grant where they recruited uh, men from barbershops. We are trying to recruit couples. So I was there last week and a colleague of mine took pictures. I have never been to a barbershop before. I lived in a part of a town which is highly polished and haircuttery is the closest it will come to a barbershop. But I felt so at home because it reminded me of India. You know, India has all male barbershops and you go and you get your hair cut. So we are recruiting barbers to work with us. And uh, so this is me last week, and this coming week, I'll be in barbershops pretty much the whole time, talking to people, trying to recruit them. So I wanted to share these pictures because this is what it means to be in the community. So I'm not yet at the end where Stephanie would have liked to hear more about, you know, how do you integrate these back into communities? Because that's the whole goal. I don't want to develop these interventions just for a five-year period, put my life and my soul, and they die, right? The whole idea is to have them back integrated in the community so that we really know we're making a difference. So this is part of the endeavor, is really hanging out in the community, learning from people, being extremely comfortable in your skin, and um, giving back, eventually integrating back. So that's my talk. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Um, first off, I wanted to say thank you for coming in. Almost everything you talked about, I was like, oh, that's great. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm very, part of my work is Bowen-centric, uh -huh. so I do geniograms and really Fantastic. interested in the intergenerational transmission of trauma, mm -hmm. so I was hooked the entire time, so thank you for coming in. Um, so first, I was, last year I did a little less than a year's um, worth of work with um, substance using um, homeless mothers. Mm -hmm. um, and we did a lot of HIV prevention work with them as well. Um, and part of our work was going directly to them, mm -hmm. right? And once we got them housed, we worked with them in their, in their housing mm -hmm. um, unit. And I was wondering how you think your intervention would be like in a, in a housing um, environment and if you think it would be as effective or not. Or That's great. So, um, you know, it depends on which one, right? So I think we really need to be in the community to deliver these interventions. I think part of the challenge is when we expect people to come to universities. And I don't know many universities outside of your university, which is right in the thick of downtown, it sounds like. Um, most often, it's removed, right? And uh, it's really hard then to expect people, even if you pay for stuff, it's not easy for people to come. So I think that's part of it, is finding places in the community to be able to deliver the intervention so that it's accessible. People don't have to spend too much time traveling to the place. However, it's really important to think you know, what you're doing and what that site could be then, right? Within you know, if I, were doing, if I were doing the independent, just women uh, who have high experiences of violence, I would be a little more careful if I would have it within the housing project, particularly if they were still living with their abuser, right? We had some terrifying experiences that the staff had to deal with for protecting the women and making sure that they were okay. We had really strong protocols to follow. However, the couples-based intervention, I feel you know, it would be more acceptable to be really within sort of a housing community and use their um, cultural center or some place. Um, the issue is that this intervention, because it addresses HIV and violence, again is very influenced by social desirability. Right? It, so there are pros and cons of doing it absolutely where people are living versus maybe two, three, four miles away but still within the community. But I think that's critical, is reaching people where they are instead of having people come to us.
would you please state your name for the extra question? Yes. Hi, I'm Dan Cooper. Hi. Thanks. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, currently, it spoke to me and my work a lot. I'm working with Dr. Liz Wheeler. I know. I recognize right your name now. as soon yeah. as you said it. So thank you for your work. It's been very helpful in writing writing our grant. It's been <laughs> great. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about also, we're doing a number of things to try to improve um, retention, attendance, those mm -hmm. types of things, because it is going to be challenging. And we, we are working. Unfortunately, you have to balance, like, this is one of the one of the challenges balancing like the evidence integrity to the evidence based intervention mm -hmm. versus like really getting people there yeah. and so we can't really cut sessions and like with the population we're working with like just doing it in less time is just really tough and so I guess um, I saw that you were able, like went from eight to six sessions and that's going to probably be really helpful for getting families there. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you recommend other ways maybe to to get folks to, to come and stay and, and still being able to like balance the... It, it's so tough, you know, and we have limitations in what we can do, but uh, because of universities have things, so people really want childcare. So I don't know what University of Minnesota policy is, but where I was in upstate New York, they would not, and we were delivering the intervention at the university, so there were lots of facilities to host this in, but they would not allow us to provide childcare. I, I said, you know, I'll hire two undergrads. They'll come sit with these children that people can bring. There were liability issues is what I was told. What if something happened to some kid when they were under our observation? So, you know, there were things that even though we tried, we couldn't really make it as friendly as potentially people would like it. The other thing is transportation. Can you provide transportation? So again, the university will not allow like any sort of transportation linked to the university to go pick up people because again, that's liability. What if there's an accident? Who is going to be responsible for that? So I, I know of somebody else at University of Maryland who's doing a couples-based grant um, looking at financial and relationship health, how they come together, which is very exciting and interesting. Um, they have funding, I think, from HRSA. And what they've been able to do is pay for Uber. Mm -hmm. Again, it's extremely expensive when you start thinking of these. These costs really add up. In my grants, I have not been able to, I have been able to give nominal amount, like $10 for transportation. I have not been able to budget for Uber. But those, if, if the R01 that you know, Liz is working on allows for that, it might be really important to think of ways of getting people there. Obviously, doing it at a place where Uber costs might be low, like getting a place in the community might be extremely helpful so that it's easier for them to come to it. Um, and be ready, and Liz knows this really well, to do makeup sessions, right? I can't tell you how many makeup sessions I had to do in my care ward as well because it's a group intervention, people don't show up, but in order for them, you know, it builds, one session builds on the other. So you have to hire clinicians who do this for passion, not for money, because again, it's not like we're paying clinicians like you all. I will have doctoral students and master's students deliver the intervention. And of course, I can't pay a lot of money, but for people to do this because they truly want to make a difference and their heart is in it, those are the things that immediately come to mind. I want to add something. I have a former doctor student, uh, Dr. Cleo Townsend, who's also um, a pastor. She partnered with churches, churches. in um, Delaware, New Jersey, and PA. Those churches had daycares. So she was able to, she was working on mm -hmm. HIV, um, running groups as well. She was able to have childcare and work with these women in the church, which was, you know, a community. But you have to partner with a church that mm -hmm. believes in mental health care. And, and so, um, so they're, they're out there to cultivate the relationships and leverage them. Yeah. I had a question. Um, so you had, oh, my name's Heather Love. I'm from Kansas State University. Okay. Um, you had mentioned that there's differing levels of violence that can occur mm -hmm. in relationships. So I was just wondering as you're going through the recruitment process, what kind of screening measures you'll be using That's or how you question. will be assessing how the violence is occurring and whether or not it's contraindicated to include them in your study. Great question. So obviously I follow a lot of Sandra Stitt's work uh, and Dr. Epstein has similar done similar work. So 
I mean, so the screening protocol, and I think that's what's making this even more difficult, is um, our IRB made us add more informed consents than we possibly want to or need to, but it's like really you're trying to please people at every level. So at this point, what we do is we're pitching the study to people. It doesn't matter which is a man or a woman, because partly we want to also assess who converts more, whether we and that's the problem with couples based is you don't find people together at venues, right? And given our topic, we also don't want to find people together at venues. Um, so we are trying to find people where we can tell them about the study. If they're interested, we do a first round of screening with them. And that's pretty much similar to what I talked about. You know, we're assessing for violence, HIV risk, substance use. But then, if they meet that basic screening criteria, they have to meet additional screening criteria, which will be with the partner. So now, this is the tricky piece, is we have to not only engage them, which was hard enough, but now we have to say, can you bring your partner in? And we want to talk to them too. Because if it's a woman, now we're, we've added some safety questions within that to get at some of the more coercive control or intimate terrorist types of violence, which is, you know, are the women afraid of their partner or not? Would they be comfortable sitting and talking about these issues together? And the second is use of any weapons or any guns or knives or anything in their relationship, or if they've had to seek any sort of medical attention for the violence. So those are some ways that we're assessing for safety. But it is getting, and increasingly we're also learning that relationship violence goes both ways. So increasingly we're also learning that there are men as well, even though the rates are lower, who are feeling unsafe in their relationship. So we can't go with the assumption anymore that it'll only be the woman, although the higher likelihood is it'll be the woman. But we still have to make sure we're asking the man too whether they're feeling safe in the relationship. And, and again, there can be disparities in reports. So we also ask about severe forms of violence, medical attention, et cetera, for the man too. So it's extremely complicated how we're doing this. And I think that's made recruitment even more challenging. Hi, Carmen Smith. When you were deciding to reduce the sessions from the six to the eight, uh, was there any um, dynamics like what were the group dynamics around session five you had mentioned that like session four session five people started tapering off um, and I just didn't know if there was more to that mm -hmm. in that area that's a great question so let me say that it's not that they came consistently for the first four sessions and then tapered off right this was random attendance but overall out of the eight sessions they showed up for four sessions so it was not a particular that's what we were looking for was there something but because the missingness was so random some people would show up for the first third seventh eighth i mean so there was no pattern to the missingness really of them not coming for a particular session so that's what made it hard in some ways as to what do you cut from the intervention um, so i'm not sure if we necessarily cut content, I think we've cut some time that we're going to spend on some things and therefore we're able to cut it down by two sessions because all of the content, I really don't know how to get rid of the content. It's really important content, um, but yet it's not working. So therefore we're cutting down on time that we're spending on the content at this point. So we'll see. I mean, if we get funded, it'll be starting a new trial right now. Um, because it's not like we've done any sort of recruitment for this because it's not yet funded. But those were the changes I sat down with my intervention manual and said, okay, what can we shave time off from to be able to do this, so. Hi, uh, my Hi. name is Katie Van Fossen. I'm from Ohio State University. I really appreciated you sharing your specific aims um, and some of that language. And I was just curious if you could speak a little bit more to the process of um, being an interventionist and a marriage and family therapist and what it's like mm -hmm. to market yourself to funding agencies because um, I seem to have noticed that often we struggle to make that jump mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you, you even mentioned clinical psychologists for mm -hmm. uh, um, instance seem to um, have this really credible evidence base mm -hmm. and we're working to understand how we should highlight our own strengths as right. researchers. Right. Uh, I think, you know, increasingly when I was studying there were not many faculty who were doing evidence-based um, interventions within their own research portfolio. So traditionally I think 
family therapy faculty have done research even at the doctoral programs, but it has not been at the level of NIH type funding. But increasingly I think that's changing a little bit. So I think working like you are working with Dr. Wheeling, working with faculty already as you are in your training trying to write more. Uh, and increasingly, I know that pressure has shifted tremendously. Increasingly, people are coming out with more and more publications. Um, I think that's really important, specifically in the area that you're trying to market yourself in, right? And initially, think of secondary data analysis. I mean, that's another thing that I don't think I was trained very well at, and so I had to go get another degree to be able to do that. But if you can build your expertise and publications with secondary data initially, to be able to show that you have content expertise in the areas that you're choosing, and then go write um, grants that are more intervention oriented. Because your publication base is what you have to use. You have to develop a bio sketch. Um, in the NIH form, it's extremely, extremely structured, and there is no way that you can hide or you know not be, if you don't show that you have expertise you won't get the funding and the second thing that I learn is you really need to learn how to work in teams right so as junior scholars that are getting out think very strategically about where you're going right for your next position whether it's postdoc whether it's academia, whether it's a community-based organization, is it giving you what you really, the skills that you want to further build on? And being able to find senior professionals in the area that you're interested in to write first publications with them. It, this is a long process, right? So nothing, be patient and keep at it. Don't give up. In the last two and a half years, I have written nine grants. My life has been a nightmare. <laughs> How many I have gotten? Two. One external, one internal. So I just want to know, and I'm sharing that because this is tough business. It's really tough. Develop thick skin to take rejection. It's not about you. It's the funding climate is awful. Competition is extremely high. So keep at it. Initially start with writing publications with a team that you really want to work with. As you have more publications with them, then you can so show a track record of being successful in publications. And then you write the grant with them. And I think be open and willing to take on responsibilities. Um, and not constantly, this is work you where you have to make a lot of sacrifices initially and say, you know what, even if I get a small role, I'll do it because I can put it on my CV. Um, so be flexible, be open, and um, don't constantly count hours. I know doctoral students, at least the way I see people, even undergrad, masters, doctoral, they have shifted a lot since I was a student. In terms of, the question is what am I getting out of it constantly and very immediate gratification. This is a long-term process. Stick it out, it'll really work in your favor. It's not my 10 hours are up and I, I mean, obviously fact, if you are being abused in a way, you of course have to think about yourself. But I think be more flexible, be more open in terms of time because, you know, I have doctoral students that have to go out in the community late evening hours on weekends. So if I have a student telling me I can't do something on a Sunday, I'm sorry, you can't be on my team. So be flexible in trying to gain a lot of these different experiences. So it takes a while, but stick in, it'll work. Um, my name is Dimashi Gutierrez. I'm from University of Iowa. Um, but thank you so much for all your information. It was so incredible to see all the work you're doing. Um, so my question was, what exactly was your brainstorming process in your recruitment of multiple uh, marginalized and oppressed identities? Um, I'm also in that area with multiple oppressed identities, and recruitment can be really difficult. So I'm just curious, what was your thought process on that? So I, I think, you know, for me, it was a huge struggle. You know, I mentioned I grew up in India, right? So I have really had to learn 
how to be really comfortable with myself in a country where I was not raised, right? And where my accent speaks before I do, right? In some ways, I open my mouth. The first word I say gives me that I'm not a U.S. I mean, apart from now, it's even harder. The, for majority of us in this room, we are not white. And it is really hard to establish yourselves as people of color. So I went through very early on in my presence in the United States a very tough, like learning how to pitch myself. Um, I knew I was very caring, but how do I communicate that over and beyond you know, my identity, that people see beyond that? Because often my identity just led first. Um, so I think what I can tell you um, is that I've gotten very comfortable with who I am in talking with people. I really respect people for where they're at. And I really do truly believe, and I really think it comes across I could be any one of them. I was just lucky to be born where I was and lucky to have my life experiences. That's the only thing that stands between me and them. And I think because I so truly believe in it, I communicate that through my presence, to my stance, to my language. Um, and you know, these pictures were not planned. They were just, my colleague was taking them. Um, and he's very, very senior researcher, African American. And I think he gave me the biggest compliment last week when he said, you're a natural. And I was huge, you know, from a high icon who I really respect up there. And for him, it was a huge risk uh, to take an Asian woman into a barber shop. I mean, these are relationships he's cultivated. He is the person in um, health equity and health disparities, has been tr doing tremendous work in the country, has a network of eight to nine barbershops and nail salons in um, Maryland. We're doing unbelievable work at all sorts of health disparities. And for him to say, I'll take you there was one huge, and for then, two, to give me the feedback that you were incredible. I just watched you in there and they can't wait for me to come back, right? So I think partly it begins with us if we really want to do this work in the community with people of different identities is how do we believe truly and do a lot of self-work first. And then I think hiring staff and being very critical about who you're picking for your study and training them really, really well. A lot of hours go in this to make sure that people are comfortable about being in the community because it's not easy. Um, and people pick up hesitation very, very quickly. It doesn't have to take long for people to know that you're uncomfortable in this situation. So I spend a lot of time training people. We do a lot of role plays till like people are so bored, but I'm like, we still have to do this. Um, so I think that's, that's about it, I think. Um, and developing very strong protocols and follow up and giving back to the community. So I often meet with people post the intervention as well to gain their trust. And ideally, it's not helpful to keep moving when you start this line of research because it takes a long time to establish these community partnerships where people trust you. And that's what pushed me back a little bit when I came to Maryland. Because